wait for this link, uh, and then let's look forward to it. Thank you.
and he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. Afterwards, his brothers talked with him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. We're reminded of the scriptures in Philippians to bring all our requests and needs before the Lord. <coughs> and expect that peace that passes understanding that we can give. I have one request that was given to me this morning. Uh, Donald Rowland's brother, uh, Alvin Hoopengartner, passed away yesterday morning. We just want to uphold uh, Donna and all of the, the family at this time in their loss. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you we know that you encourage us to ask and to come before you with our petitions and our needs, our praises. But this morning, Father, we thank you for the place that we are at in our pastoral search. Uh, you have been good and led us through this to this point, and we know you will be faithful as we continue. God, I want to uphold Donna Rowland and her family today in this time of grief and sadness loss or brother. We just pray, Lord, that they would be very conscious and aware of your presence as their good shepherd. We know, Father, that you do give us peace even in these difficult times. Father, we continue to uphold our, our nation, our people, as we continue to face the pandemic. And Father, we just ask you to Help us to do this intelligently, God, that we may return to what may be called a new normal. But thank you that we can bring everything to you, and we don't have to be anxious. We can bring it to you in prayer. We commit this to you today. Pray for Donnie as he brings our message a little later this morning. Amen. <coughs> Oh, 
after three sermons, I was afraid nobody else would show up. But thankfully everybody's here. Appreciate your presence. It is amazing how God works in His timing. So the last three Sundays uh, we played the song Waymaker. We talked about God making a way. And after how many months He's bringing us a pastor. Isn't it amazing how God works in His own way, in His own time, in His own place? While things are different, no, they're not. They're still the same. We just work them out different. We still serve the same God. He still controls everything. He's still our way maker. Yesterday, uh, for instance, I uh, had the privilege of attending the National Conference of the Brethren Church from the couch in my basement. <laughs> it wasn't a four-day affair like it usually is where you hear speakers and have a program. It was a Zoom thing. And it is amazing. Uh, sitting in the basement on my sofa talking to folks from around the country. And I just want to give a shout out to our own Sarah Moore. She was elected to the National Executive Board of the Brethren Church yesterday. directly from St. James on the National Board. So this morning, waiting from fear to forgiveness. I was sitting there in your chair thinking, okay, Donnie, it's the third Sunday in a row. Why are you this nervous? We still have a little of that fear no matter what. But this morning, in the scripture reading, Genesis 45, 14, and 15, we have a scene of reconciliation where Joseph wrapped his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept. And the very last phrase that was read said, and after that his brother spoke with him. When we have strained relationships amongst people and we don't speak for a while, we finally have that scene of reconciliation. It seems that now we can speak to each other. As we looked at the life of Joseph over the last three weeks, we saw where he was put in a pit, sold as a slave, and then sent to prison. All unjustly. All because of the wrongdoings of others, he was made to suffer. But God makes the way. Now we've kind of been bringing, trying to bring through the idea that in spite of the pit, the slavery, the prison, this was God making a way or a path for Joseph to be the head of the kingdom. If that's the path God chooses, do we really want him to be our way maker? How many of us have ever prayed for patience? <laughs> You know what that's going to bring, don't you? The minute you pray for patience, there's going to become, there you're going to be faced with a situation where you're going to have to practice it. Do we really want to pray for patience? But yet we know that's the only way we're going to get it. If Joseph's path led to the pit, the prison, slavery, all for because of somebody else's wrongdoing, Shouldn't Joseph have held a grudge against his brothers? They put him there. It was their fault that he was where he was. Yet, in the reading this morning, we read where he wept with them and they spoke together. If there was ever a reason for anyone to be bitter towards life or to hold a grudge against family, Joseph was it. But today, I'd like to take a look at how Joseph forgave his brothers and thus lived in freedom versus his brothers never once apologized to Joseph for their behavior, at least not written in the scriptures. And they were constantly afraid and feared that Joseph was going to retaliate. Genesis 42 <laughs> 
verses 21 through 23 says this. And they said one to another, Surely we are being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen. That's why this distress has come upon us. And Reuben replied, Did I not tell you not to sin against the boy? But you wouldn't listen. Now we must give an accounting for his blood. Joseph's brothers, when they went down to Egypt to buy food and were in the, in the palace, and Joseph met them, while they didn't recognize Joseph, Joseph knew them. And the minute something happened that they weren't, they were afraid of, they were reminded of what they did against their brother. Even though they didn't even know it was their brother speaking to them. Which tells me that throughout their, their life, that nagging in their mind stayed forever. Joseph was 17 when he was sent to Egypt as a slave. He was 30 when he ascended to the throne. There were seven good years of plenty, and now they were in the second year of famine. So it was almost 22 years ago that his brothers did this injustice to Joseph, and they were still reminded of it. It still nagged them in the back of their minds. They did not have the peace in spite of what they did. Now Reuben was the one who tried to save Joseph from the pit and failed. So I guess Reuben felt like he was a little better than the rest of them, so therefore he reminded him, see, I told you, I told you not to do this. But, go to the next slide, please. I want to just say this. I'm not sure where this came from, but I found this quote and I thought it fit perfectly for this morning. The first to apologize is the bravest. The first to forgive is the strongest. And the first to forget is the happiest. Happiest. Were his brothers brave, strong, or happy? None of the above. Versus Joseph, was he brave, strong, and happy in spite of everything? Joseph was governor of the land. The people, who, the man who sold grain to all the people. Those of us that are familiar with the story know how that the king had the dream. Joseph interpreted the dream. Seven good years of plenty and then seven years of famine. It says during the good years, Joseph collected all the grain from all the folks. They paid a huge tax. They gave it to the governor, and then during the seven bad years, he distributed it back out to all of the people. And this was the situation in today's lesson where the famine had even reached the land of Canaan. Can Jacob, Joseph's brothers had come from Canaan down to buy grain. And here they were in front of their brother Joseph. And when they in chapter 42, verse 6 through 9, and it says, Now Joseph was governor of the land, the person who sold the grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their face to the ground. And as soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where did you come from, he asked. From the land of Canaan, they replied, to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Now listen to these words in verse 9. And then he, being Joseph, remembered his dreams about them and said to them, You are spies. You have come to see where our land is unprotected. Now if I was in Joseph's shoes and I remembered my dream and my brothers were in front of me bowing down with their face to the ground, I know what I'd say. <laughs> I told you it was going to happen. 
That's what I said. But Joseph did not. Why? Because he was the bravest. He was the first to forgive, so he was the strongest. He was the first to forget, so he was happy. Just ahead of this, it says, Joseph then remembered his dreams, which tells me he had forgotten. He forgot all about it. He wasn't out to say, I'm going to prove that I'm right. Did you ever wonder why Joseph didn't at least remind him of the dream? He may have, but it's not recorded. What an opportunity to rub it in their faces. I know that's what I would have done. The human nature in me says, mm hmm, that's all you said. See, I'm right. Or, why didn't he seek justice? For all the wrongs that were done to him. Would he have been justified to seek justice? Would he have been justified to seek revenge? Is revenge ever scriptural? Is revenge ever the right thing to do? Romans 12 verse 19 says, Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Did you ever hear the expression, kill him with kindness? I just killed with kindness. That was my mother's advice to me as a child growing up in school when I came home and said, so it so would mean to me today. Just kill them with kindness. Now if I'm trying to kill them, even though I'm using kindness, is that really the right thing to do? <laughs> if that's my motivation to be kind, then I guess, I don't know. But kindness at least will be felt in me. Psalms 25 verses 21 and 22 is where Paul is actually quoting from in the book of Romans. And there it says, do not take revenge. If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. And then that last little phrase, and the Lord will reward you. Does that mean God's going to reward us for pretty burning coals on people's heads? Did you ever have somebody you knew didn't like you? And you were kind to them anyhow. And literally you watched their head explode. <laughs> I like that little emoji on uh, today's texting apps. It shows the head just blowing up. And you can just watch them. You can see that your kindness is driving them crazy on heaping coals on their head. Is that what that means? I don't know. Some commentators said that in that day, obviously, if your fire went out and the coals became cold, you had no choice to go to the neighbor and get a hot coal, bring it back, and restart your fire. And that maybe in the book of Proverbs, it meant don't just give your neighbor one coal. Put a bunch of them in there, and people carried things on their heads in those days, so therefore you have a pile of burning coals on the person's head to go back home with. I don't know. Either way, we get the drift of what they're saying here. Be kind to those folks in spite of the fact of how mean they are. How many of us would be like Joseph and return such kindness for the treatment he got? We should at least hold a grudge, right? That person hurt, hurt me, and that's hard to forget. So I'm not going to talk to that person. I'm just not going to talk to them. Or you know what? I walk, they walk right beside me in church this morning. They didn't even bother to say hi. So why should I ever say hi to them again? Or you know what? They said something nasty to me on faith about me on Facebook. So I just don't like them.
He who holds a grudge harms only himself. Forgiveness is both given and received. Remember this. The first to apologize is the bravest. The first to forgive is the strongest. And the first to forget is the happiest. Joseph had every right by humanistic thinking to hold a grudge, but he didn't. He extended the gift of forgiveness. But forgiveness offered is only effective if it is received and believed. Those to whom forgiveness is offered must receive it or they will continue to live in fear. We see in chapter 50, verse 15, that Joseph's brothers lived with that fear most of their lives. When their father died and was and passed on, they immediately went to Joseph and said, Hey, Joseph, uh, just in case you forgot, your dad said that you must forgive us. Wouldn't it have been better had they not gone, had they gone to Joseph and said, Your father passed. It reminded us. We were evil towards you. Please forgive us. Thank you for the kindness you've shown us. And we're sorry for what we did. Did Joseph's brothers ever apologize to Joseph? Not in recorded word. Genesis 42, 25 and 26. Joseph gave orders to fill their grain, their bags with grain. To put each man's silver back in his sack and to give them provisions for their journey. So they came all the way from Canaan to Egypt to buy grain because of the famine in the land. And Joseph, knowing they were his brothers and how evil they had been to him, could have at least, I don't give them half a bag full. Or drop a couple bitter seeds in the sack of grain. Nobody would have ever known. But no, he filled their sacks full of grain, he gave them the money back, and then said, here, here's lunch, supper, and dinner for your return trip back. He rewarded the very people who put him in a pit, sold him as a slave, and had him end up in prison with free food. He keeps Simeon. You kept him in jail. Well, if you read it right, he locked them all up for like three days. And then left them out, gave them the food, sent them home, but kept Simeon as a test to see would they even bother to come back for their brother. Now, it's interesting as the story goes, the brothers went back to Jacob and the food, and eventually they their food ran out, and they said, we need to go back to Egypt again. But the guy said, don't show up unless you bring Benjamin with me. And the whole time, where's Simeon? Sitting in jail back in Egypt. Did they really care for him? They didn't come back. They didn't, they didn't want to say, we got to go back and get fed because we got to get our brother. When Joseph's brothers went the second time, According to Genesis 43, it says, So the men took the gifts, doubled the amount of silver, they took the money that they were supposed to owe for the first batch, they took it along with them, lost money for a second batch. <coughs> they hurried down to Egypt and presented themselves to Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of his house, Take these men to my house, slaughter an animal, and prepare a meal. They are to eat with me at noon. So when the brothers went to the food bank to get more food, Joseph saw them. He had them taken to his house, which immediately frightened Joseph's brothers. Why? My father had this saying he always told us. He said, we usually expect of others what we know we're capable of doing ourselves. So if we're a cheat, we expect everybody else is going to be cheating us too. If we're mean and nasty, we expect everybody else to be mean and nasty to us too because that's just what we would do in that situation. So we expect everybody else to do what we do. So when Joseph's brothers were taken from the food bank to Joseph's house, they were worried. They had a little bit of reason to worry. Remember, Simeon's still in jail. 
and they themselves were locked up for three days the first time they were there. But in reality, they were being treated as special guests. They were taken to the governor's house. If y'all got invited to the governor's house for dinner tonight, you'd think it's pretty special, right? Because you probably have to be pretty special to get invited to the governor's house, and there were Joseph's brothers. And ironically, when he seated them, he seated them according to age, and the brothers were all like, hmm, what's going on? So he fed them supper. He gave them all the food he, that they came back for the second time. He not only gave the money they brought back, but all of the money they had, gave it back to them again, put them in their sack. Then he developed the test. He put his own cup in Benjamin's bag and sent them on their way. And then chased them down. He let them get a day's journey away. And he chased them down and, he, and the steward said, the master's cup is gone. I think you got stolen. And they're like, in their typical brash style, no, we did not. He who stole it is going to die, and all the rest of us will be your slaves. So in other words, they convinced themselves, they convicted themselves before they even were tried. If it's here, we're going to die. And lo and behold, it's found in Benjamin's bag. Thankfully, Joseph, being the calm one, having forgiven them, said, ah, okay, good. The steward said, well, let it be as you say. Whoever is found to have it will become my slave. The rest of you can just go home. And then what happened? Karma. Karma struck. The cup was found in Benjamin's bag. Now, in the Hindu and Buddhist religion, karma has the implication of if I, they believe that everybody dies and then becomes reincarnated somehow, some way. And the first time, your first life, how good you are, says how good a life you're going to have the second time around. And then if you're even better then, you get a better life the next time around. And eventually, you, you reach utopia or perfection. Is it okay to secretly rejoice when karma strikes somebody and say, they got what they deserve? Does karma have any place in Christianity? With karma, we get what we deserve eventually. In Christianity, Jesus got what we deserve. Grace is the opposite of karma. Romans 5, 20 and 21, the law was brought in so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign throughout right, through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. By standing for the law, the greater the offense equals greater punishment or justice or karma. But grace, the greater the offense, just means a greater outpouring of grace. Joseph demonstrated this in real life, thus giving Joseph peace while his brothers carried the fear. Remember, the first to apologize is the bravest, the first to forgive is the strongest, the first to forget is the happiest. happiest. And I hope you notice that forgiveness does not depend on an apology. Did Joseph's brothers ever apologize? But Joseph extended the forgiveness anyway. In fact, Joseph had forgiven his brothers long before they ever had the chance to even meet him or see him again. They never even had the chance to apologize and Joseph had already forgiven them. He had forgotten about it and forgiven them already. The way to happiness is through forgiveness. Accepting Jesus Christ and His sacrifice for our sins. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. It is forgiveness and acceptance of its completeness 
that will bring us true happiness and peace. The devil will attempt to get us to believe that we are too sinful, we are too weak. We are not holy enough, we're not righteous enough to be forgiven. But Joseph's brothers still had the nagging doubt about Joseph's forgiveness. So much so that, remember, they felt they needed to go back when their father died. I think it's ironic that when the brothers went after their father died, they, from the recording scriptures, they lied. Because as far as we know, Jacob never told his brothers to tell Joseph that he must forgive them. So they even lied about that one. Would not it have been better had they went to Joseph and said, I'm sorry. We twist, forgiveness can never be demanded. It doesn't matter how much we apologize to somebody. If they choose not to forgive us, we can't demand it. We can't force an apology. Therefore, we can only change what we control. Do we for, refuse to forgive until somebody apologizes? Remember, the apology cannot be demanded. Be responsible and accept the consequences. We must also forgive whether the offender deserves it or not. That's the way of peace. God is our way maker. He gives us the promise of peace with forgiveness. Our promise keeper, he will work the miracle of reconciliation for us. He is our miracle worker. So in closing, I'll just say this. The first to apologize is the bravest. The first to forgive is the strongest. The first to forget is the happiest. Matthew 6, verse 12 says, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Forgiveness takes away the fear. Forgiveness brings peace. Apologies are nice, but optional. Forgiveness is mandatory. We cannot hold a grudge. Forgiveness lightens our burdens and frees us to live as God planned. If we desire God's forgiveness, we must forgive others. The Lord's Prayer says, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Therefore, if we choose not to forgive the trespasses of those against us, we're asking God not to forgive us. We desire God's forgiveness, so we must forgive others. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 16 through 20 says, For now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, a new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer. O oh Lord our God, thank you for your grace, for your forgiveness. Forgiveness is extended free to all who ask or seek. You take away all fear and replace it with peace through forgiveness. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters in Christ, we pray that Christ's reconciliation reign in your life, both now and forevermore. Amen. Let's be blessed with a closing song. Lord bless you. And keep you, make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you, Lord, turn his face toward you, and keep you peace. Make his face.